right now. We'll start off by going to Canberra to catch up with somebody who's probably glad he's not in South Australia right now. That is the federal member for Barker, Tony Passon. Thanks for joining us, Tony. Afternoon, Chris. Now, Stephen Marshall is your Liberal Party colleague, your Liberal Party Premier, but you must be dismayed at this. Surely this is a dramatic overreaction to the cluster they've got at Parafield Gardens. Well, Chris, obviously the outbreak is of concern, but I woke up this morning fairly confident in the view that we were pursuing a suppression strategy. Uh, unfortunately, it seems to have uh, morphed into an elimination strategy, and uh, I've got constituents uh, take people uh, like your own mother who lives in Mount Gambier in my electorate. They're 500 k's away from this outbreak and now they'll be subject to exactly the same quarantine arrangements as people living in Adelaide. And I don't think that's the kind of nuanced response uh, we need to have if we're going to learn to live with this disease. Absolutely, yeah. You mentioned my family. My father's in aged care in Mount Gambier. They've been locked down for a couple of days, no visitors. And as you say, 500 kilometres from anywhere that's had an infection in the last six months. And this is playing out right around South Australia, but it's also everybody in Adelaide. Businesses having to shut straight away, school shutting, no school, no sport. Um, what can be done to prevent this sort of overreaction from state governments? Well, the challenge, Chris, is that state governments see this activity as popular. We've seen it across the country. But I'm worried that, you know, there's a sense that small businesses have an unlimited resource to be able to stop and start and that kind of capital. And almost as though they've got unlimited shots in the locker. I'm, I'm here to tell you and your listeners, the small businesses I'm speaking to, um, they have magazines that are close to empty. And um, the bullets they've got to keep firing and keep their livelihoods intact are ones they're borrowing for the bank uh, right now. I mean, I would have hoped that we would have an approach that would have uh, perhaps better understood how we live with the disease. I mean, you mentioned before, I mean, the, the measures that have been implemented today, aside from the fact they've been implemented incredibly quickly, and let's hope they're only for six days, even at the height of this crisis in Victoria, when there were over 700 cases a day, people were still able to go and exercise one hour a day. That won't be allowed to happen in South Australia, in Adelaide. It won't happen in Renmark, you know, 300-odd kilometres away from Adelaide and Mount Gambier 500 kilometres away. I would have hoped that we could have a more nuanced res response. There are only so many roads in and out of Adelaide. Uh, managing those would have been a good start. And before someone tells me, oh, look, there are so many ways to get out of Adelaide, there are far fewer ways to get Adela out of Adelaide than there were um, roads to get into Victoria. And we managed that issue perfectly well over the course of the Victorian wave. So uh, I'm just hopeful that this is just the six days. It's very concerning, uh, but it's the uncertainty this is breeding. And uh, I've got constituents ringing me. People have rung me all afternoon. I'm here in Canberra because we have to be here. Otherwise, we might get locked out by the ACT government. But uh, I've had people ring me all afternoon saying there are police officers at supermarkets because people are panicked. And of course they're panicked because this de decision's come out of the blue, Chris. It is such an extreme response. And as you say, so many businesses have failed already because of lockdowns. Others were just starting to trade open again and trying to re-employ people. Now they're forced into at least a six-day lockdown again. It's going to cost more jobs. It's going to cost more businesses. And my point about all of this in Victoria and other states is that it's unsustainable. Yes, if you knew you'd do this once and then the virus is gone, of course you would do it. But we all know the virus will still be there and you can't keep imposing these lockdowns on various states and various communities time and time again. Which is why I think we need to look to Gladys Berejiklian and the system she's operating. Uh, her approach to suppress this um, is the right approach. Uh, Mark McGowan criticising that approach today, I think, was uh, ill-advised. Uh, and I, I think any Premier, uh, Chief Medical Officer, uh, other decision makers um, are ill-advised to follow that course. We need to learn to live with the disease and the way to do that is to identify outbreaks, manage them locally and allow businesses to continue um, to trade. We're talking about two million South Australians effectively in lockdown uh, for a week uh, and I hope it's only that, Chris, but um, I... You know, Gladys has been managing outbreaks of equal, if not greater, numbers and she's never once turned to lock her economy down and that's the right approach and it's one that should be taken across the country. 
Now, Tony, uh, does your Prime Minister, does Scott Morrison need to do more? We know from all these public statements that he doesn't agree with these approaches, but he's loath to criticise them because he doesn't have the power to prevent it. He's trying to encourage the states. Is there anything more he could do, anything more that Canberra could do to force these states to adopt a response that we can actually live with rather than pretending they can eliminate the virus? From a formal point of view, uh, Chris, you know that there is very little we can do. Uh, what we need to continue to do is advocate uh, and communicate informally behind the scenes, pointing out the kind of economic toll um, these measures uh, are taking in the hope that we can adopt a more pragmatic solution going forward. I've already had employers on the phone to me today asking for JobKeeper uh, to be extended um, in um, South Australia. Now, that fails to understand exactly how the JobKeeper program is operating at the moment, but this is the kind of problem. The problem that popular measures taken by state states are effectively paid for by the Commonwealth. Um, I know the Prime Minister's uh, view is one where we need to adopt uh, a New South Wales style management and I know he's talking um, behind the scenes directly to Premiers. I hope they're listening because if this is the response every time there's a breakout and there will be breakouts um, then we might uh, learn to live with the disease but but the livelihoods of Australians will be massively impacted and I just don't think that's tolerable. Uh, such a shambles. Thanks for joining us, Tony. I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Tony Passon, the Liberal member for the federal seat of Barker in South Australia. He's in Canberra. You heard why. Now, I mentioned before that so far there's no one actually ill, severely ill, from this cluster in South Australia. I don't downplay this virus. As you know, we know that uh, people who are vulnerable, especially the elderly, do get very sick and die from this virus. It is a risk. We do need to take it seriously. We've taken it seriously on this program throughout the year. But it's all about the proportionate risk and the damage you do with the other measures. I'm very, very well aware, as you heard there, with my elderly parents in South Australia, we need to protect the vulnerable, but we've got to keep our response to this proportionate. Uh, otherwise, we crush people's lives and livelihoods and we can do even more damage than the virus would. Now, some people are being caught up in horrible situations here. We mentioned yesterday that some people already in hotel quarantine in South Australia were having it extended because there'd been an infection at their hotel, so they had to go back to day one.